very happy new year to you and a warm welcome to the first episode of series three of the Pension Confident podcast. January now, and many of us are thinking about resolutions for the year ahead. But what if your resolution is to be your own boss? Have you dreamt about it? Setting up your own business, maybe getting a side hustle going where you're the one in charge? But then the doubts creep in, don't they? Has your brilliant business idea got legs? Where's the money going to come from? And what about all the admin and legal stuff you'll need to tackle? No question, getting your micro business off the ground can feel really daunting, but it's not impossible. And understanding everything that's going to be involved is the best place to start. So today, we're going to explore the very first steps you can take on your business journey if 2024 is the year you decide to take the plunge. Very much go into like, how big's the market? What's the competition? How do we be different? How do we enter the market? How do we make money? Sometimes it's quite good even when, you know, you have these big business plans to come back to something very simple and be able to explain your business plan to someone. I think when you're starting a business, it feels like everything, right? It's your baby, it's your passion, you are so into it. But actually there is a whole life outside of that as well and that has to continue. I have three entrepreneurs with me. They've all made that leap themselves. Janesh Vora is founder and CEO of Sprive. That's an independent mortgage platform that aims to help customers become debt-free faster. Hi, Janesh. Hi. Joining us for a second time on the podcast is founder and CEO of Vestpod. That's a financial education platform specifically for women, Emily Belle. Hello, Emily. Hello. It's nice to have you back. Yeah, thank you. And this month's guest from Pension B is not only the chief corporate officer, she's also our third entrepreneur. She's the founder of children's wear business Little Circle. Her name is Lisa Picardo. Thanks for being with us, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Before we start, here's our usual disclaimer. Please always remember anything discussed on this podcast should not be regarded as financial advice or legal advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. We are going to hear all about your own startup experiences in a minute. But first, I think I would like to know about that moment you all stopped dreaming about your ideas and actually committed to making them reality, getting them off the ground. I mean, what prompted that? Was it a conversation with someone? Was it redundancy? Emily, what, what prompted you to think, OK, I'm going to do it? One very specific moment. I had a meeting with a financial advisor who asked me, where is your husband? When I wanted advice on my own finances. Wow. So that really, you know, started you know, my research and discovery of, you know, how can we help more women become financially independent? Yeah, absolutely. I completely understand that. That's amazing, isn't it? In yes. this day that was and really age. annoying, though. Yeah, really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Jinesh, how about you? I was at uh, an investment bank um, and there for 14 years and always was focused on trying to progress through the kind of getting the next promotion. And then randomly, a colleague of mine grabbed me and said, do you, do you, you, know, do you want to have a, a conversation? And he basically told me he was leaving the firm and he was going to start his own business. Okay. And he was like, I just had this um, thought that we should have a conversation to see if we want to do something together. And that kind of led us to, after work, sit, sitting in the cafeteria brainstorming business business ideas and we churned through a whole bunch of ideas and within a five month period we then came up with the idea for Sprive and and, uh, and now here we are today. So it was the notion of being your own bosses rather than an idea? Yeah exactly we, we actually artificially came up with uh, the idea once we were focused on deciding that we were going to do something together. That's interesting because I want to ask you later on about people who are in that situation they know they want to do it but they're not quite sure what but we'll, we'll get to it. Lisa how about you? I think I'd long had that sort of ambition of one day running my own thing. I had a couple of sort of catalysts really in my career. One, my boss, who I absolutely loved, left. So it meant that, you know, leaving the city, I didn't have to resign to him. Two, I was sort of in my 30s and I think I just had two children and sort of being at that moment really made me reflect on like where I was. Did I want to be doing the same thing forever <clears throat> or did I want to take that plunge? Hi, it's me, Philippa, just interrupting briefly to remind you to click on that subscribe button so you never miss an episode of the Pension Confident podcast. Remember to share, rate and review too. And now I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of this month's conversation. Happy listening. I mean, now we've got a sense of what sort of businesses you launch. Should we start with first steps? What were your goals? Because I think this notion that we want to be our own boss is one thing. You sit down and think, OK, we're going to do it. Did you sit down and write a list of what you were hoping to get out of it? Or was it just, 
I'm going to start this business. I don't think at the time I had a, a big goal in mind. It was very much a, a journey. And I think sometimes when you set yourself big goals, they can be quite overwhelming. So I, I'm a big firm believer of setting, like focusing on the next kind of main task that you need to achieve and then start chipping away. So if I think about going back to the beginning, we were kind of trying to find the right idea. And once we've, and, and it was almost going through a process of validating ideas. Once, once we felt like, okay, we've got a good idea, then it was like, okay, what do we need? What's the team that we need to, have the founding team to be able to have a good chance of making the idea a reality then it was like you know should we start talking to investors do we need to start talking to people in the industry etc and so one by one we were kind of focusing on what was the next kind of step we needed to take we keep doing step that after step. a step after step it wasn't a big goal for me because the business is really interesting it's about helping people pay off their mortgages faster than they otherwise might. Do you want to just tell us a bit about it? Yeah, sure. So it's essentially an app that helps homeowners, like you said, pay off your mortgage faster and save interest. And we do this in a, in a few different ways. So one is we help people set aside spare cash. And with one tap, you can essentially make a mortgage overpayment. You may obviously all know uh, mortgages have uh, become much more expensive with interest rates rising. Not even everyone can afford to even put spare cash towards their towards their mortgage. So then we've worked with a lot of top tier brands like Asda, Amazon, uh, M&S, Waitrose, Uber, like the list goes on. So every time you shop with those brands through the app, you get extra money towards your mortgage within 15 minutes of the shop. Again, with one tap, you can pay that towards your mortgage. And when did you launch? Just over two years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's not long, is it? No, not but, long. Emily, you, you said it was really annoying being asked <laughs> what your husband thought about your finances. <laughs> like, I think we all understand that. But um, what were your other specific goals around being your own boss? Life was, was pretty full on, uh, working evenings, weekends. And at some stage, I wanted to work on something different. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to have more independence. I think you can have this thing with entrepreneurship, but of course, there's a lot of trade-offs. <laughs> sure. <laughs> when I set up Vespod, I had this really big mission. And I think when you start a business, it's important to try to solve a very big problem that will help you on this next goal, this next stage and, and carry on the on the journey. But I had then smaller, smaller goals, as you said. So, you know, how could I break it down? And I started Vespod in a very simple way. I was like, okay, I'm going to learn about personal finances. I'm going to meet as many financial advisors as I can and try to help women in the process. So I started writing about personal finances and I started literally from my kitchen table writing uh, a newsletter uh, about money. So I think these like early, early goals, something really small that you can achieve and move to the next thing that helps you validate your idea. But I think in the, in the early stage is trying to test, test your idea a little bit. I'm interested in the idea that it's so easy to fall in love with your concept, isn't it? We have a thought, think, yeah, this is a great business, it's going to be great, it's all going to go really well. So I would like your thoughts on how do you stress test your idea? I mean, obviously there's research and development, but I'm thinking more around understanding what it might be. Are we talking about a side hustle? Are we talking about a micro business? Are we talking about something you, you know, in the future you want to see it floating on the stock market? I mean, how would you suggest people set about that mental process? With Vespod, I wanted to try to see if people would pay for my services, would pay for a product. So it was trying to launch, you know, basic product, the easiest thing possible. And, and the, one of the first thing we launched was just a class for 20 people teaching, you know, personal finances. And I was the teacher. So that was a massive learning curve for me. But I, you know, put up this even bright page, you know, design the logo and okay. try to get people to actually sign up to this course. We had a lot of people signing up, a lot coming from finance, which was really weird for me, having all these people coming from finance wanted to yes. learn about personal finances. That was really stressful. But at least that validated the need for people to actually want to pay for education. So I would say, talk about your idea, try to get so some feedback. There's a really good book called uh, The Mom Test. So trying to get honest feedback about your idea is hard because your parents, your friends, your partners will tell you it's, it's amazing yeah, what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, Lisa, how did you do that? I mean, yours was around pre-loved clothing for kids, wasn't it? How did you yeah. market test the idea? I totally agree that I think what you do need to do is you develop that idea and then you, you know, you should tap into your networks. You should go and talk to as many people as you can. I think the more you do it, the more you kind of get that elevator pitch straight in your head for us we tested it out we spoke to magazine editors we spoke to customers we spoke to you know all sorts really to sort of get that feedback and you know make sure that we were actually pretty confident before we went live yeah I mean it is true to say you three were all well connected so I want to get into the head of people who just don't have your sort of networks and I want to ask you do you know if, if you were thinking about that from the point of view you were not working in the sector you were in before how would you have set about working out whether your idea 
was really viable. And how would you set about looking at the competition? First of all, treat it as like a little bit of an academic academic exercise. And so very much go into like how big's the market, what's the competition, um, what are the challenges they're facing, um, how do we be different, how do we enter the market, how do we make money. And, and you did all this online? You went and looked at the competition? Yeah, so you, and you, yeah, yeah look at the competition, download the products, and just get a real sense of like, can, can we do something different? For example, talking to customers, we built a wait list of not building the product but theoretically showing them what the product might look like and 2,000 people signed up to the wait list saying I would love to use this product An another example is talking to investors and speaking to them to see have they seen anyone else build something like this what could be the pitfalls etc etc even doing things that are quite cheeky like um, talking to people who are the competition technically and understanding how their business works and, and, and trying to get a little bit uh, of intel. So presumably um, you didn't tell them at that point you were thinking you're setting up yeah, a Yeah, it was just an <laughs> idea. I was just like, I'm a customer, I have a, you know, I have a mortgage, etc. <laughs> and just trying to get intel because the more information you have, the more equipped you're going to be to be able to succeed. Once we came up with the idea for Sprive, we then spent six months validating the idea. And it was only until we I felt like we properly validated the idea that I actually quit my job and, and, and started and started Sprive. Then we had some really good signs where like we had investors who said like we had a PowerPoint and there was like, can I invest in the idea? We even had people in the mortgage industry who were like seasoned CEOs who were like, can I invest? Okay. And the, and the network, I didn't really have that network because my network was with banking. So I had to artificially like put, put myself out there and create that network. And so, you know, for anyone listening saying I don't have the network, I don't think you ever do. And so you had to really go out there and, and kind of uh, and build that network. And how scratch. did you do that? What I'm doing, and it's a, probably the top tip that I can give anyone who, who does start a business is to post on social media every day. So I use LinkedIn as a platform i would say it took me a little bit of a while to kind of start doing that but that's kind of really transformed out my business in terms of it's helped me connect with investors helped me get new customers helped me secure partnerships the power of social media is is, is incredible that's really encouraging so obviously linkedin it's available to everyone isn't it a question of how, and there's loads of tutorials as well online about how to get the best out of platforms like that so it's not like you have to start from scratch and without understanding what you're doing i want to talk now about business plans because this is what everyone always talks about. <laughs> and when you read into it online about what your business plan should look like, the range of opinions you get is just huge. So the first question I think I have is how detailed should your business plan be when you start? Lisa? I mean, I think it really depends on what your own expertise is, because I think there'll be some will come from finance and, you know, like myself, will be very sort of au fait with building business plans but you'll have other people who have a, a terrific idea and a concept and actually it's not their bread and butter doing the finances so then you know for, perhaps for them what they need to do is sort of buy in that expertise or team up with someone who has it and I think it's really important to sort of have the discipline of writing your business plan in words and then trying to translate it into numbers I do think you have to try and I do think you have to be on top of it you will learn and you will evolve and grow so in many ways it's about getting clarity on the idea for yourself as much as for anyone else and obviously these business plans aren't set in stone are they they develop because the other thing is when you start I mean, the data you have, the ideas you have about how much money you might spend, how much money you might make, it's all estimates, isn't it, Emily? So how useful is a business plan with lots of numbers in it? You know, a few numbers, we call it back of, it, of the envelope, trying to see, you know, if I build this business, how am I going to make money? How much is, gonna, is that going to cost me? There's a good tool called the, the Business Model Canva that you can download online that's for free that will help you identify stuff. We've been talking about like your key partners, your competitors, costs, revenues, and Try to sort of map out uh, what is your business going to look like. And it, it's helped you. It's a little bit like a, like a framework. So it doesn't need to be very detailed. But of course, as you progress with your idea or you're looking for funding, you will look to, to get uh, into, into the details. Sometimes when you have very complex business plans, uh, it's very hard to get the big picture. And yes. you may, you know, mm -hmm. get some huge documents. about, you know, yeah. where the money comes from and stuff. So sometimes it's quite good even when, you know, you have these big business plans to come back to something very simple and be able to explain your business plan plan to someone who's not part of the business. With startups, all the ideas that you have and things, they're all assumptions. There's a lot of curveballs that come your way yeah. and nothing really goes to plan. So spending a lot of time you know, creating this big document is probably a, a waste of energy. We had a PowerPoint and the PowerPoint just every time we did research, we would, I would document it and make it look, um, summarize what I'd learned. So if I'd done lots of analysis on the competition, I would then say, well, what did I learn through all that hard work that I did and try to summarize that in a one page PowerPoint? Oh, that's a nice tip because I'm wondering, 
I mean, obviously, you need to plan, no question. But I am wondering whether there's a danger of over planning so that you actually mm. never get started because yeah. you're constantly thinking, oh, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. I mean, you can never know everything. What you can guarantee about business planning is that it will not turn out as you think. It Everyone will. says this. It yeah. just won't. It's quite, it's it just won't. Worrying. And so I actually think <laughs> it's it's really about getting the, like, what could good look like and what could bad look like. Yeah, the one thing I will say is that numbers don't lie. So that I've met founders who spent two, three, four, five years of their life. And if they did the, the upfront work on paper, they would never have made money. And so they've gone through the journey and they should probably never start the business in the first place. So I do think it's like, at least on paper, be able to like say, OK, this thing can work. Obviously, things then you'll have mm. curveballs. But if on paper, the business will never work, then you shouldn't start do the business. Do not start the business. <laughs> do not start the business. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, can I just ask you about kind of partnering up on this? Because obviously we're already understanding there's a lot of work here. So, I mean, Lisa and Janesh, you you partnered up too, but you didn't, Emily, is that right? You started on your own? I started on my own, yes. Challenges of that? I mean, obviously you can kind of see it's your idea. If it goes really well, it's all yours. But was it quite quite hard work doing it on, on your own? Yeah, I think in some way it's hard work, but in others uh, you may you probably move faster on other things because you're the only <laughs> decision maker. But, but no one but to I, say actually, Emily, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. I had um, I launched another business before Vespod where I ha- where I had some some co-founders. It can be complicated also to manage co-founders, uh, you know, relationships. So that's why I decided after uh, you know this business not working that I would start Vespon on my own. It's not like I'm doing everything on my own. I have a team. I have a lot of, you know, support. We have advisors. We have a network. So I'm not doing everything on, on, on my own. So I think it's 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 a personal decision of, you know, do you want to do it on your own? Do you want, do you want a co-founder? But you may want to talk about, you know, co-founder relationship, but it's like being in a in a marriage. So it's, you know, something well, yeah. you have to, to manage properly. Thinking about partners or co-founders, did you formalise the relationships with your co-founders straight from day one, as in a That's legal a agreement question. between you? So for us, I think there was a lot of, I mean, my best friend was my partner, so I was frankly delighted to be married to her for that journey. <laughs> um, it, it was it was a very happy marriage. To your point, you know, we had different roles and responsibilities. When we set up the business, we set up a, you know, limited company and we were 50-50, so we were truly um, co-founders. We had, you know some agreement in place in terms of for the major decisions we will do these things together and then in other areas we've sort of said well actually that's your domain and this is my domain for me i i don't think i could build Sprive just alone i think i'd uh, i think i'd crumble three of us in total that, that started Sprive. and so um there was my colleague that i that i worked with and then we decided that we were going to build a tech company and none of us could code so we felt like <laughs> it would probably be a good idea to to bring in a cto and so fortunate enough a chief technical officer yeah a chief technical officer I think it's really good to act as a sounding board. You almost sometimes get like get into arguments around certain things, but it's really a good way of stress testing whether the the next step that you're taking is the is the right one. Let's move on to the nuts and bolts. Let's talk about the money. People think about bank loans, don't they? I mean, I think it's fair to say you three had some degree of connection when it came to financing your businesses. If you don't, I think most people think about a bank loan. Good idea, bad idea. How easy are they to get? I, I mean, for me, a bank loan sounds sounds quite scary um, because it's quite easy for the the business to. I mean, most startups, if you look at the numbers, I mean, ultimately, most startups do fail. So, having a personal bank loan, if you if you set up like a you know a, a partnership or, a, or or as a sole trader, you're you're, you're personal, personally liable. So, I I would almost prefer to like bootstrap if you're going to come up with a small business idea and have a little bit of like savings that you kind of set aside invest that into the business get more money back bring that into the business and start to really be confident that you've got a a good profitable business that generates revenue on a very reoccurring basis and then you can with high level of confidence you can then say if i want to take out a loan i know that if i take a loan and deploy more capital i'm going to get more money back and it's less of, less of a gamble. So save, yeah, save to get the business that, off the ground be, rather than borrow. That, that's what I would do if I if I didn't have an idea that relied on kind of investment and and, and capital. Everyone's nodding around the table. 
I've bootstrapped business uh, until now. So it's basically trying to launch the business um, with a very minimal cost. So for me, that was a website. I was doing the one doing the courses and stuff that helped me get some money into the business that I then you know, reinvested in the business. So that's a way to grow organically. It may take longer, but you keep full independence of the business. And then you can decide that you want to get uh, external funding and where you'll have to give shares, you'll have to give equity to your investors. And there's different ways. Usually when you, you go through the, the funding journey, if you manage to bootstrap at the beginning, it, it's great because you sort of try to get your idea off the ground. Then people usually look at angel investors, so individuals who may have you know a little bit of money uh, to spare, usually high net worth individuals. So of course, when you worked in you know banking and finance, you tend to have these networks. So not everyone will have a network of you know angel investors or friends and family, friends and family money. So there's a lot of um, talks <laughs> about that. That can bring, that can bring <laughs> yeah, complexity as well. But I think the great thing about this day and age um, is that there are a lot of resources out there that are very like cheap or very or free. So if you want to create a website, you can you know, use a platform like Webflow or Wix or, um, or Squarespace, and quick, quite quickly you can you can you know, find assets that um, that images etc. Like stock images yeah. that you know that are the gain free that look very good. And then like there's AI and there's ChatGPT and, and there's amazing things that they can do. Yeah, spend as little as possible. Because yeah. Lisa, I mean the other side of this, of course, is there's a temptation to plow all your savings into this into this idea. Yes. But thinking with my cautious head on, I mean, you need to keep a cash cushion back, don't you, to look after yourself if things yes, go badly? Yes, absolutely, because I think when you're starting a business, it feels like everything, right? It's your baby, it's your passion, you are so into it. Um, but actually, there is a whole life outside of that as well, and that has to continue. You need a roof over your head, you need to pay for your children, you need to, you know, keep the car going, you need to do whatever, whatever it is that you were doing before. How big a cash cushion... Should you keep six months expenses or I mean, what's your suggestion on that? Because I mean, it I'm, matters, doesn't it? I'm not sure there's one answer to that. I mean, I think it really I think there's two sides, really. One is what are the factors around your business? Um, and then the second is what are the factors around your lifestyle? You know, are you on your own? Do you live with someone? Do you have a partner that can help, you know, shoulder that sort of financial responsibility of life whilst you are starting your business? So I think it is a very individual sort of decision really based on your your circumstances can we talk a bit about structure i mean how you should actually set up your business as sole trader there's limited companies partnerships pros and cons any strong thoughts on that yeah so I mean, we've set up a, a limited company and that was because it was very clear from the outset that we needed shareholders we needed to raise capital and so that's the, the traditional way of how you would structure a, a, a company like that and you don't take personal liability which which is obviously good um, so you're not going to lose your house so, so you're not going to lose fair. your house mm -hmm. exactly whereas if you're like for example a sole trader or a partnership you have personal liability and so if the company has personal debts they hit your debts Emily any thoughts on how you should make that decision I think you should definitely have an accountant. It's probably, you know, a cost, but I would say an investment for you when you when you set up and have a first conversation and, you know, an accountant, especially in small businesses to understand, you know, the, the, the tax relief, making your account, especially if you're, you know, a limited company, you have a lot more responsibilities. So you have to publish yearly accounts and stuff like that, potentially register for, for VAT at some stage. Uh, so they will be, you know, really, really helpful. So I, I want to kind of get into the pros and cons of them. I mean, would, from what you're saying, it sounds like you think you should set up a limited company, however tiny your venture is. And that's not an expensive thing to do, is it? I mean, it's worth saying that. But you think you should. Yeah, I think it's pretty sort of simple and straightforward to actually set up your company. I, you know, I asked my husband, who's a friendly lawyer, to sort of do it for me. And I spoke to my dad, who's a friendly accountant, to sort of help me along Handy that way Handy family well. you've got. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, okay. but but I do agree. Like I think it's thirteen pounds to register a company, um, and then obviously you need to do your annual accounts. So proper advisors. Proper advisors. And what, one thing I would say is that for me, setting up a limited company that was because. I had a big vision for the business. So even if the business was small, I thought, you know, maybe one day it's going to be a much bigger business. So, you know, I will have the, the structure. I will have a, you know, history of annual accounts. So that's, that was helpful. But it was also about separating my personal finances versus the business finances. And I know when you're a sole trader sometimes, I mean, you should definitely have separate business accounts uh, because it can be very confusing sometimes when you start paying from your own account for the business, for yourself, uh, you know, your mortgages, they all come from, from the same pocket. So even if you're a sole trader, make sure you have separate at least bank accounts okay. uh, for your for your business. So if you're setting up a little retail business online or something, just yourself, you know, at the kitchen table in between working with someone else, you should have a business account 
and keep everything separate. It's, it will make your life easier because you will also have to pay taxes. You know, there's expenses that you could deduct and you're going to work with your accountant and having things separate uh, will, will help a lot. And if you make investments in your business that comes from your personal bank account to your, to your business bank account, but you should document everything that you're doing. Okay. Uh, we all know this. Is, this is not going to be easy. I, mean, I think the stats you alluded to earlier, Gina, she said you're on average. Uh, I think it's 20% of new businesses fail in their first year. More than 60% only make five years. And this is all quite dispiriting. But having said that, that means 40% of them do fine and keep on going, right? So common mistakes. What common mistakes do you see startups making? For me, it's focus. So trying to do too many things at the same time, building something quite complicated and then sort of losing losing track. So I would say, you know, keep it simple. Cash, cash is king. We talked about uh, cash flow, especially for small businesses. I think that's, you know, the main reason why, why you know, startup actually close. Yeah, I also think, I mean, all those things are like kind of like common reasons. I think also if you, if you start to like get onto the journey, um, you'll find certain things that happen that you didn't anticipate. And so your ability to be able to like um, be quite agile and kind of reacting to curveballs that go your way. Is there a piece of advice that would have made a difference to you in the early days if you'd known it? Something you know now? Everything takes a lot longer than you think. Okay. So uh, you think, you know, I remember um, talking to my wife when, when I had the idea and, and, we, and we decided that I was going to leave my, my corporate job behind. And I was like, don't worry, in, in about a year, I'll be earning a salary. It took me two years. And to she earn asked to say, and she said. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, 18 months later, when when when's this salary coming? <laughs> yeah, Emily. I would say it's about the journey uh, and not the destination. Uh, it's a very long journey. <laughs> so it's like a series of, of sprints. You think you, you know, got somewhere, but then you're working on the, on the next thing. So I would say try to enjoy the journey. If you're really not enjoying it, if you feel it's not working, you should really reconsider, you know, your, your, your plans. Take care of yourself and your mental health. We talked a little bit about, you know, the business within your life and it takes a lot of space, a lot more space than you would think. Mm-hmm. It's like maybe having another child for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Evening, and you stress and you, yeah, yeah and you stress a lot about it you think about it all the time so try to have like strong uh, boundaries and that's a really important the, the mental side of things i don't think i appreciate that appreciated that at all having a good support infrastructure um because it is really tough what was it i mean did you fight it sounds like it's gone really well but was it really tough yeah it is tough because like you say it's something you never you, you don't you don't um you don't switch off so that's one thing so trying to be present sometimes you're having a family event and you're still on your phone where you manage your whole business people notice and and then there'll be like other stresses and you don't want to like you know, there's other stresses you've got your team and you know you don't want to lay on the, the stress of the team because ultimately they're looking to you as um as, as for inspiration and guidance etc yeah. etc et and then you've got your family life and you don't want to you don't want to necessarily lay, lay on to them and i found leaning on other founders is is, is a really nice way of totally. doing it because you're all going through like similar challenges i think you know, we know there is a lot to think about here, but I hope it's not going to put people off kind of giving it a go. Just a last reminder that anything discussed on the podcast shouldn't be regarded as financial or legal advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. Next month on the Pension Confident podcast, we'll be looking at the financial barriers facing women and how to smash them down. But do not think this is only for women. Trust me, there will be lots for everyone to know in that episode. Remember, if you've got the Pension B app, you can now listen to the podcast on our brand new in-app player. Give it a try next time you check up on your pension. Thank you. Uh-huh.